Uh, before I get started, I want to thank just right now uh, the the Pancake Man. Thank you so much for your tier one subscription. And uh, England's very rainy. Just followed, and I did get a bunch of folks following. And so, uh, and for those of you who have been flying through here on the on the comments, I haven't said I big fat aloha to all of you. So let's get going. Um, I'm a sneak. Thank you so much for the occasional drop-ins that you do. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, for my mods that are hanging out, I'm just going to be listening to music, eating food. I'll be peek peeking over at the comments, and I'm going to be leaning on you guys for your thoughts. So here we go. This is uh, Boulder's Gate 3, original soundtrack, very recent release. Uh, and um, I definitely have never heard it, and I'm just letting this thing run, and let's do this thing. All right. that change up I mean I don't know what's going on visually but I love this kind of stuff when they ease back on you Wonderfully thematic. Uh, I know I'm at the very end of this, but I, you know, we'll continue on. Wonderfully thematic in the sense that it's already establishing uh, a melody, which I believe is a da 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 da. And the I don't know. First of all, if somebody could do me a favor uh, and look up for me who the composer is. I, I should have done this before that. Forgive me. Um, uh, are using some very brash and bright orchestral sounds. Uh, the double bass uh, spiccato kind of uh, is very punchy and very um, uh, Borislav, Borislav Slavov. Okay, thank you very much. Um, composer uh, Borislav uh, is using these very punchy uh, double bass sounds, kind of a chopped spiccato marcato kind of vibe, so you hear the resonance of the strings without it having to be a big fat section. It's a technique that we use sometimes to really emphasize certain lines that we want to power through in the tones without it being overly large and bombastic. The bring down with the little harp that is playing that I said, oh, that's nice that they change gears. Um, the vocal pass that she's singing, I love the fact that we changed the sounds of the vowels as the melody progressed. Um, and that might be a very small thing to point out, but going from the oohs to the ahs and as the arrangement refills and builds back in, there are these big, bold, fat horn sections. But I'm, I'm kind of reaching for a little bit. I'm, 
right now it's early on to say, but I'm trying to think of how the engineering technique is going here. But for, for, for an opening soundtrack or a main theme, this is a great setup, you know, for uh, a memorable melodic um, journey. <laughs> I love the high voice right there. Oh, this is going to be a fun sit, everybody. I'm feeling it. You know, these are not your normal storm drums. These are like Tycho style drums. So knowing this is a part two, an ex, you know, an expanded version of the uh, melody, we're hearing these unique, different phrasings now, melodically of the same melody was set before. Okay, I just want to stop it there. I know that was a short, that was like a part two of it. One of the things that I love when composers uh, kind of stretch out on if, uh, is the fact that this now had a little more energy. It was darker, it was bolder, it was a shorter version. You know, the, the richness and the thickness and the power in the position and the mix of the horns uh, is really fat. But one of the things that I love, and, and as a composer, I, I feel this because I've done this before, is that pattern that do that do that do do that do 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 that then that was in the harp, and as that was building, that shifted into the spiccato string started taking over as the arrangement started to build up, and as the arrangement started to build up, then the composer gets bolder and bolder with the sections and filling in. One of the things that I've noticed so far, and I'm that these are some of the things that I'm listening for, is that. Um, the technique of using a small section or smaller sections, let's just say, um, within or outside of the fact that like the string section is the most bolder section in representation in the dynamics of an orchestra in this particular piece, that there are still smaller horn sections. They're not full, it doesn't sound like they're full dynamic bombastic blasting, you know, uh, sections, uh, if you would. And these are techniques and stuff that really allow uh, the power of these arrangements to stand out a little more in a unique way. And it also depends on the orchestration of it as well. And if you're a composer and an orchestra, uh, orchestrator and somebody who uses hybrid techniques of live and, you know, um, modeled um, orchestral uh, samples and stuff, you know what I'm talking about there. All right, let's go on to the next one here. Uh, now it looks like we're actually going into uh, some of the different uh, titled themes of this. So let's go. Yupper. Yeah, 
very villainous, you're right. Kind of reminds me a little of Lalo Schifrin. Kind of an Enter the Dragon thing. Dissidents there. So I guess mind flares, as I'm learning, is uh, um, like I guess here uh, fluff corns here, saying that it's uh, easily one of the most iconic D and D monsters up there with uh, mimics. I guess I don't know, uh, but it is a very nemesing you know, and kind of uh, mischievous darkness, the vibe that the composer's setting there, uh, the bounciness of the, of the strings there in this kind of, once again, in his style, I want to say his style, in the choices of the dynamics that he's using with those strings, <clears throat> I'm leaning into a little bit uh, more into a staccato than a spiccato, I don't know, uh, kind of a vibe with it. But it's definitely front, first and forefront, you know, is to cause that anxiety of like, you know, the tension. And I've said that many times. It's a go-to. You want to cause tension, you're going to use the strings a lot either in the trems or you're going to, you know, arpeggiate and have these, you know, ostinatos and stuff that are going and repeating and so on and so forth. But these breathing in and out heavy darkness of the horns and stuff like that gives you that like, you know, could something creepy be coming up behind you or something like that. And that... That's what this track is giving me. See how that fades out. Nice job there. in the background. Heavy, dark change right there. And, you know, at the, well, here I am at the end, I didn't know. Um, so this is, a, this is that kind of macabre tension setting kind of vibe. Um, that horn that, da, 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 that's leading me to believe that there's a little more of an edge there um, that could be wheel, wheel manipulated in the sound. 
Um, the whole thing, that little chord change that he did a little early on was so spot on gnarly, you know, to continue the energy of, of this kind of, once again, this mystical darkness that didn't have like death written all over it, but definitely heat, you know what I mean, coming down at you. And, and the introduction a couple times of a clarinet in the background just kind of softens the blow a little bit. And I mean that in a good way. I mean that in a dynamic way. And you hear that clarinet come in because the clarinet has has a, a more of a hollower, rounder sound. I mean, well, it can be played to be too, but we like to leave that up to the oboe. But that having a couple times where it sounded like, a, it sounded like a clarinet could have been an English horn too, but um, I like that. I like that, that, that little special accent. That's like looking at a Michelin star plate in front of you. And you know, the main thing is here, but you all of a sudden your eyes catch some of the stuff that they do around in plate preparation, I guess it's called or whatever. That's what this gives me a vibe. So there's only a few seconds on this, and then we're going to get into who are... I know you guys are probably going. Oh, I'll bring it back a little bit. If this is, I'm reading that this is a, a, a character creation track, and I said some. So somebody said here that people spend hours just, you know, getting their thing together, their character together, and this music is 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 entrancing, and it's so well written um, because there are still it's it's still soul pulling, and at least to the first few tracks that have set me up here, definitely fits. Um, you know, the, the sonic vision thus far. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are two notes that are a constant through that, that are very unique. Whether you know it's there or not, it's registering in you as a listener. When I talk about the constant, I talk about like a drone, like from a bagpipe, you know, or any, any other drone instrument that relies on a drone, and then you play through it. And... Um, I'm not going to hum those two notes to you or anything because I don't want to destroy it for anybody. But I love when composers knowingly take this ability as kind of like a kind of like kind of decision. Like I know how I will keep everybody captivated and still be able to flex the ambient ethereal vibe with the vocals that, the, that she's singing, but keeping you entrenched in it or in, entwined or entangled in it with the constant arpeggiation of the harp thus far. And I love that. And if this is, if like you guys are saying, this is one of those things that, you know, um, you're, you're, you're putting on a mustache or you're choosing the color of your eyes or your sword or the size of the bulge in your pants. I don't know, whatever it is you can do. I had to stray somewhere. That if this is going, it's keeping you, you, you might be there for three or four hours. So as a decision for the composer to you know, say, hey, somebody might, people might hang on this for a while. I got to make sure that I can make it palatable. You know, absolutely excellent job. I'm going to take it back a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about the bold statement. Cancel.
What a great track. I loved it. Subtle but powerful, like I said, but it's gonna keep you in there. All right, what do we got here? Nine Blades, guys. Track number five. bizarre horn thing happening behind this phrasing here it's like a single like it could be a fugue or or something but it's a very unique addition in the back and it's not you know i love the opening of this track where the vocals where the darker voices you know choral voices came in and they were doubled by like let's say the trombones and um you know it could be tuba but that section is just it just viscerally gut punches you tonally you know, when composers will do that, and especially composers who write vocals or choir pieces along with, you know, uh, an orchestral uh, bit here. But, um, yeah, I just had to stop and say that. Let's go. Bit of a timing difference between the percussive aspect of the guitar and the orchestrating, which is normal. Composer has a unique high-end percussive uh, arrangement that goes that's going there, like a clacking of a sticks and stuff. Once again, like I said at the very beginning, I don't know what the selection of percussion that he's using, but it is such um, it is very old school pre-Renaissance style percussion. What I mean is, it really sounds like the skin of an animal over a drum. Uh, it's got a rubberiness and a darkness to it, uh, tone-wise. I can't, you know, I'm not trying to peg it. You guys know I'm not a, a ethnomusicologist. I don't know every instrument or by any stretch of the imagination. But there's a unique high percussion that he's using in the back. Like I said, these kind of slapping stick sounds that really make a lot of sense here. I really dig that.
You know, the other cool thing about this is the fact that there is a very obvious um, focus on the string instrument, the guitar. I don't, I don't think it's a guitar. It's, it sounds like another instrument of sorts. It could be, but um, it's not loud enough to be instantly discernible. But through this whole thing, believe it or not, as large as the choir and the music has been, the constant has been a really great level on the establishing percussive nature of the of the stringed instrument let's just say that i'm just going to say guitar for guitar reasons and through this whole mix anytime that 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 instrument has had any life it definitely was not toyed around with too much in the mix it was like the leader of the pack percussively setting you into a tone vibe of what it is and it sounded like there could have been two string instruments at one point you know back and forth but um that the very important part of this track is that in its engineering that that string instrument has really solid life in the mix. presence of the guitar okay just gonna go back just just literally just for the last 10 seconds and then I'll say something just but I want you to focus on the presence of the guitar in the mix <laughs> okay and what's great about that for me is that when I explain it to you guys as an engineer and also somebody who's listening to music in a particular way and layering it in a particular way where arrangements get the due moments that they get, think about it. If you had a guitar player, a single guitar player, sitting in the front of all these musicians live, you wouldn't even know that it's there, in essence, you know what I'm saying? Horn sections, string sections, vocals, choir, you know, dark choirs and stuff like that, and you're not, you know, Sure, if it's live, engineered and stuff, you know, it can be manipulated and stuff, but just when you structurally envision in your head a guitar player on a stage and then, you know, you've got DEF CON 5 going on behind you, you're going to get drowned out and stuff. And that's the magic of recording and stuff and, and the uniqueness that engineers um, have the power to do, you know, of course, working alongside with the producers, composers, and people all involved to say, hey, listen, you know, we got all this stuff happening in the background, but I don't want to lose any of that guitar. And then the engineer does a hell of a lot of drugs and goes for it. I'm kidding. <laughs> but stress-wise, it could be really stressful for you engineers out there. Anybody who's out there as an engineer, you know what I'm talking about. Chew. Next up, this is Quest for a Cure, Baldur's Gate 3 original soundtrack. All right. Spooky ethereal. Heaviness, dark forest, foggy, cold. Tell me what this is making you feel. Lack of hope, aimless, was perfect. That 
flange on that horn. Heavy moment of reflection too, right? That chord change was like maybe a possible hope. You know, the clouds part for a second, moonshine through kind of vibe. So the unique thing of this is that when we first started this track together, we, we all felt that same kind of hopelessness and all the great things, aimless and all the things that you guys dropped here. And it did, it gave us that. But as soon as, as, soon as a timed uh, or a metered arrangement came in, and what I mean by that is, um, I mean, obviously, if you're conducting, even if it's Roboto or something like that, you're giving it some kind of movement with, you know, time. And you may let it, and you might even start off with the click. Let's say it's uh, 75 beats per minute. It's in your ear, dot, dot, dot. And, but you bring it in Roboto and stuff. And when you have nothing percussive in the arrangement, um, you can really make it flow and stuff. But as soon as you start adding the, something that's percussively locking into it, then you start to achieve uh, a little bit of that pre-anxiety kind of vibe. And I liked how he just took us through this, and now he's bringing us back into this lulling segment of the track. I don't know if you guys heard this in the background, but there was some sound design back there, some wind. And we talked about this before, using white noise or pink noise, and I, I really dug that. All right, here we go, what is this? Need your fights, let's go. with the dulcimer. Absolute battle music. No two ways about it.
The composer reaches into kind of like an Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern vibe, Celtic, with some of his work. that dulcimer. Second overdub, very dry. I like the multiple layers that he's just using the strumming percussively with the guitar as well. You notice how um, a high percentage of these tracks really focus on darkness, heaviness, obviously because of the game, but stay inside a pocket, chord-wise, change-wise. Trace 42, uh, yeah, I understand, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna stop it really quick. Um, it is, this kind of music is that kind of music that gives you that opportunity in your head to be making choices, I think, that are different, let's say, with regular gameplay battles and boss battles and, and stuff like that. Um, the, the heaviness of it, too, it seems to be that it calls for these tracks to be um, like I said, in the zone, in a pocket. So there isn't there isn't a lot of breakaway as of yet. Jeez, this is only track eight I'm on. Uh, you know, doing big, bold, you know, sweeping, melodic changes and and um, you know neoclassical, anything of that nature. Everything's been very soundtrack oriented, soundtrack oriented, pulling classical and hybrid. But it's a lot of like staying in the pocket, staying in the zone. It's a lot like, you know, if you're in the key of D, you're in the key of D for this whole track. One, you know, and then you're going to not drift too far out there with the other options you might have with voicing, supporting arrangements and changes with the melody. This has been very powerful. This has been very purposeful. And uh, but what's unique about it is like listening to this here without gameplay and stuff. I thought, I'm sure that those of you who've played the game and recognize the music, you're probably hearing obviously a lot more different things in this music presentation than you would against gameplay, exploding, fighting, and sort of stuff like that. So, so let's see what this is. This is this is harpy song. Oh 
sounds like this might be some kind of heartfelt moment in the game between characters or something. Oh, wide open in Ambient, refix. Beautiful piece. I really like this. Say wow, what a trip! Because I'm reading the comments, and what a unique part of the gameplay, um, where they use their voice to dominate your mind. This would be that kind of a seductive piece. That's why at first I, th I thought wide open ambient and stuff. And somebody had mentioned here that uh, it, it's still combat music, but it's in an open space with cliff and slow waves crashing and stuff. So in the visual, that makes sense. But uh, what a unique, tricky, like uh, you know uh jedi mind kind of vibe on you know messing with your head in a game remember i don't know anything about games i've played five or six now Woo! and um and still haven't even really gotten through any one of them except for the you know the journey and the and the obzu so this kind of headiness in the game i guess where you have these little sirens as i somebody uh you know i guess that's what somebody said uh join a cult kind of a siren song that kind of swoos you and sways you into like, you know, come over here and taste the peanut butter, you know. <laughs> All right, guys, going from harpy song to the weeping. Let's go. All right. <laughs> I'm not gonna try the melody so the building up of the melody that we just heard um, which was really beautiful how the composer just was you know stretching us out with the strings as she was going da 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 and that then that starts with just strings and beautiful and just kind of stretching us and then all of a sudden the, the danciness of the strings started to lift a little more then there was a beautiful reed that was behind her voice in unison it's just like an octave higher as it starts to build and get and, and get bold and stuff and I love that because I, I don't know the, where this is in the game and this is actually a song I believe um, but it is um, that whole little combination of stretching us in and out starting out starting us you know with the softness of the strings and bringing us into this build while the melody still is, uh, stays the same I thought was great and like I said there was that really nice little read that was an octave higher behind her voice that emphasized uh, the melody <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, she's singing about her grief. Okay, that makes sense. So I guess in this scene, the woman is singing about her grief of a lost friend. Uh, that exactly is what this was all about. It felt like it. It felt somber. It felt, it felt yearning, you know, um, and it felt like a, a call. It, 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 it was sad. But there were a couple of chord changes the composers did that kind of really relieved you a little bit of that heaviness, where he kept it kind of, you know, in this kind of minor vibe in the key structure and then actually twice had kind of lifted it into a major for maybe just a beat and maybe whenever you see me make the, the face where I kind of like go ooh that like that is something that a composer does uh in his arrangements that make me go ooh that was a, that that what 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 are we what are we thinking there what are we going on there so that's just more of like uh um you know the spock one eyebrow like kind of vibe doesn't mean it's good or bad it's just it i heard it like me saying, I heard you, I heard you. All right, so the next track, track number 10, is Cunning Cruel. So let's hit it. That fun part right there, we've got a, we've got that bottom end just keeping that boom, boom, dun, 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 dun. But in the background, in the cello section, it could be violas, there is the double agitation, not an agitato, but a double agitation, where while there's still the bolder part of the arrangement, it's still boom, 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 boom. But with the string second section, you saw me go, you know, those are the really fun dynamics in there. This is definitely an ass kick section uh, song or track kind of vibe where there's like some really heavy hitting dudes doing something here. At least that's what it feels like to me. It sounds like to me. Double with the horns and the strings there. Here we go again with the 
you hear the acoustic guitar on that? Let me take that back just a little bit. Listen to that. More percussive than... Oh, so you're outnumbered in this. Okay, that makes sense with music. Hear the little bassoon in the back. It sounds like a track where it'd be a bunch of little something or other goblin. What did you say? Co a goblin camp battle, you know, and having that. It is. It, it had that gnat in the ear anxiety vibe to it, you know, where you're just hot, always on edge. You're like, going, geez, come on, overwhelmed. May not be the most gnarliest part of the game, like one that you can work yourself through, but more like, you know, Gulliver's Travel kind of vibe where you got all these little shits around you trying to hack at you. But really nice, you know, once again, using, he's, now I can tell he's sticking to a particular palette of sounds when it comes to his, I, I want to say his tom-toms or his giant drum sounds with that little cleaner, higher, crispier, percussive uh, part of it. But also the fact that the composer goes back to, uh, in what would be otherwise, like I said earlier, a very large sound um, dynamically as having an orchestra on stage and still using the guitar strum as a method of percussion as a percussive um, part of his arrangements, which I like that decision, you know. It, it, still, st it still sticks and stays into the organic, like it's a live guitar being strummed and, and something that's not forced into it. But uh, I like the way the composer's bending that in there. Okay, the next one, 16 Strikes. Here we go. Definitely like a call to action, going to war kind of vibe. Like it's all coming at you. Spooky there. This is a great section right here.
one thing I'll say so far, one of my 12 tracks into this is that this is, this is thus far an OST that you, you definitely have to marry it to the visuals. I know that might sound odd to, 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 to say, but let's just say I'm listening to the full OST of, well, I've only listened to a few actually, let's say Outer Wilds. And Outer Wilds has, um, obviously, it's nowhere near dark and bombastic and gnarly. Therefore, the composition in Outer Wilds is going to be less dramatic and heavy and stuff like this. But um, there's a different, different type of landscape listening. Like, you can listen to Outer Wilds tracks while you're cooking and doing stuff. You can listen to these tracks while you're cooking, but you're going to be cooking like this the whole, the whole time with the eyebrows down and the heaviness, you know. And this game seems like it's really, I mean, music-wise, if I'm reverse listening, you know, I'm not playing the game, I'm listening to its music. Sounds like it's a really heavy, gnarly, grindy, um, you know, journey to whatever it is that, you know, the end game is. Of course, very combat oriented. Yes, like John, uh, John Occult saying, um, uh, you know, if they're combat oriented, if they're achievement combat oriented, and then especially if they're um, mystical, you know, time period, uh, mystical time period. I don't know if that's a right way to put it. You know, um, it, uh, then it's going to be always heavy. And right now, after <laughs> 12 tracks, I'm feeling kind of heavy. Like, and also all the tracks at this moment have been very uh, obviously purposeful to the mission of darkness and moving through and plowing through it all, you know, which is really a super um, uh, obvious. Somebody saying a couch potato says there's also a lot of dialogue as well. Uh, so I guess maybe the dialogue is a nice breakup between this, like listening to this in a row, pow, 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 to where, you know, there would be the, the actionable play with the music behind it, and then there would be a break in that, and then there would be dialogue. It's kind of like to clear your head and your palate between, you know, answering questions, yes or no, or something like that. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that kind of vibe. Hey, Shadow, how's it? How you doing, brother? So that's what... You know, I'm getting so far, at least in my own vibe of what I'm feeling here. <coughs> okay, let's go on to, uh, this is uh, track number 13, and this is The Colors of Under Rourke. Under Rourke. Loves that dulcimer. Under dark. Oh, I don't know why I said Rourke. I guess it's the writing in my eye, bad eyes. Under dark, under the ground, and like a haunting cave delay. But it works great with the voices, fantastic. Very hell oriented, apparently, by uh, Joyna Cult here. Oh, 
I don't know, that dulcimer though, it kind of pulls you out of it. This is classic composition for film. You know, setting setting the, the vibe here. Combination of sound design too. I love listening to that reverb run off like that. Um, yeah, based on the comments, this is definitely it's sounding the bowels of hell, but I, I kind of like the very colorful mushroom aspect of it though, that um, somebody had wrote down here. I think it passed on already, but um, um, I guess also it's got like these multiple biomes. But for what it is that I'm listening to, when I said this is classic film style composition, is that this is something that easily could have gotten out of hand with the composer. And one of the more magical parts of this that really sent it for me was whatever the voices were, the male voices, um, the engineering and the odd little flange in there uh, or, or kind of phase shifting that's going on, but the really unique use of um, the delays on that and the response of the delays actually have to do with the arrangement, you know, how, if, you know, if you hold down a note and it has a long delay, it really doesn't matter. It'll start to fill in the left and right, depending how you have it panned. But if you do unique uh, melodic uh, things with that and then put on a, an aggressive delay on that, it can really create some real unique um, sound textures. And that's what we heard there. And that was really, that was a super sick takeaway for me on this. Outside of that, it was to establish the heaviness of like, you guys are saying it's kind of like underground, different biomes, heavy, dark, musty kind of vibe. I will say a couple times that the dulcimers kind of threw me off. Like in my head, I'm going, yeah, this is like some really dark, heavy place. And they went ding, 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 ding. And I was like, oh, okay. Maybe they walked past some, you know, stalagmites or stalactite or something. I don't know. But all right. So the next one is Twisted of Force. Well, let's do that. All right. Well, it's coming up in a second. It's got to run off in a second. I'm eating cheese and an apple. <laughs> Yeah, this does have a gent thing going on there. Super low tune. <laughs> Drop there in, in uh, lower section. Yeah. 
triplet happening there um that whole track was just the bang about that whole thing to me were the vocals and there was and that odd vibrato that they were using in there or had he, he had created in there powerful curse and death shadows curse and death A bit of that Danny Elfman going on. That yeah, definitely doesn't sound like anything pleasant is happening in the game. dissonance in there. up from the piano. Each one of these tracks are 
Um, like I said, these are really giant, huge, dark underscores. Uh, percussion is served up hot and heavy on just about every single one of them. Uh, the darkness and the heaviest, obviously, you know, there's, you know, that I was thinking about it just uh, towards the end of it going, you know, how, just exactly how difficult that it is to be extremely original when you have, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm i stuttering because I can't imagine it. And I may have mentioned this before, if you were to have 10 composers lined up and this is the dark scene, um, the last night, whatever this is, it's a, whatever it is, giant battle section. And that every composer short of, but still including, hybrid composers that might use EDM with orchestras or a gent guitar or some gnarly, you know, metalcore, um, you know, uh, work. <clears throat> it's just, it's almost like, you have, you have some limitations there. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of beginning to yearn for something completely unique and different <clears throat> from, from a composer doing a scene like this that that can stray away or still use some of the elements that we're hearing you know big drums big horns swelling horns darkness heaviness low end stuff big choirs that do this and they're dissonant you know it's like it's almost like giving us 10 composers you roll out the same salad bar so okay here's the salad bar of what it is that you can use sonically or, or you have in your influences you know, what can we do to produce a piece of music, write, compose a piece of music that's bombastic and gnarly and battle it, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I understand when I have comments where people say these are great pieces of music, but they sound the same. <coughs> that's not, that's not to, I'm not giving the people's elbow uh, to any composers by saying that, but it's like that's where our brain is at, you know, or that's what, that's our sonic, I guess our sonic lock that if you see things exploding and banging and stuff, you're expecting the gigantic horns and stuff. And I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else that could be done differently as a composer. If like, you know, if you're going to do a dark, heavy chase scene, gnarly scene, monster scene, battle scene that requires, you know, blood and guts on the battlefields, gladiator style or something, you know, it's, it's going to always be that same kind of style, you know, and I just, it's, it's very unique to, you know, I don't know. It's it's kind of it's kind of trippy. It's a trippy thing for me to say it, but that's just how I feel as a composer. You know, as far as like a, a you know looking, still listening for a unique. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, approach. And once again, I'm not saying just because I'm saying this right now during listening to uh, Borislav Slovov's music. He's he's a fantastic composer. He's a great arranger. Two different things. You guys know that, right? Composer, arranger. Uh, a phenomenal arranger. But I'm just saying, I just, I'm listening going, oh, man. You know, it's like I, you, you can AB it when you start saying, oh, Danny Elfman, oh, John Williams, oh, something like that. It's like looking for that unique, when's that unique thing going to happen? But, uh, you know, 